Welcome to Path to the Great War. This is Melinda Cole Klein. The Rise of Conflict Between European Powers by the 1910s is inexplicitly tied to underlying factors, as in all historical events. The Great War altered the course of the modern age. It is important to view this war not only from its onset and what started it, but also the years and decades leading up to it. Underlying factors that led to the First Great War included alliances, recent German unification, and conflicting rulership styles. Factors including royal family dynamics and intrigue, imperialism and war aims, cultural attributes such as militarism and national unification challenged peace between European neighbors. All the while, the two great military powers engaged in an arms race. These powers were the newly unified Germany and the long-standing military presence, Great Britain. The spread of democratic-style governments, influenced by the popularity of 18th-century Enlightenment thought principles, challenged older authoritarian rule. One side supported political authority by the ancient rulership style of the divine right of kings. The ruler sees himself as God's instrument on earth. This political philosophy regarding rulership common in most European countries until derided with revolution or civil war was considered comical by the 1750s in Britain and France became embroiled in a revolution by 1789 because of it. However, as a governmental style, this practice was alive and well in Central and Eastern Europe by 1900. This rulership style did not give in to the will of the people. After all, the people could not be trusted to do what was right for the nation. Autocratic rulership is far from democratic. After all, Congress and Germany the Reichstag argued for a more democratic form of government for decades only to be ignored by their Kaiser. Change would come later. In Russia by 1902 workers and the upper classes were increasingly opposed to the royal government. They too argued for constitutional reforms and threatened revolution reforms did not result. In 1917, revolution came. In Russia, the reluctance by the monarchy to adapt to the changing times and outside political pressures led to revolution which replaced their government by another. This is the evil of communism. In 1871, the newly unified Germany-Prussian Empire made its entrance into the imperial world. Quickly, German advisors professed to Kaiser Wilhelm I to join in on the scramble for colonial possessions, which they did, while manufacturing military ships, training troops, and boosting its artillery power. In England, from 1861, Queen Victoria spent almost a decade in mourning her husband, Prince Albert, who had unexpectedly died of typhoid. In her political absenteeism and avoidance of political issues over long periods, the government for a time was ruled similar to that of a republic until 1872. All the while, members of Parliament increased the naval capacity and the military strength of the nation. 
Britain had enjoyed centuries of supreme power and was not about to lose it over the flexing muscles of newly unified Germany. A looming factor in the inevitability of war between these two superpowers stood on who would reign supreme on the high seas and who would possess the most colonies making nations wealthy and powerful. With German unification and the invasion of France by 1871, also known as the Franco-Prussian War, followed by the Spanish-American War and the Russo-Japanese War by the century's end, from an American perspective, it was best to remain neutral rather than to be dragged into another European war. Americans had been long accustomed during the colonial period of becoming intertwined in British wars with the Dutch, French, or the Spanish. Historically speaking, world power has belonged to the nation with the strongest navy. As the young United States would learn by the end of the 1800s, European powers have competed with each other for economic, territorial, and political reasons. During the 17th and 18th century, European powers clashed in wars often over colonial territories. After all, territorial boundaries could change if a military presence was successful in undermining the power of the empire. For a little bit of background, I would like you to consider the following. In colonial America by 1763, the French were out of North America with a British win during the Seven Years' War. The French prowess and the British military clashed again in the American Revolution. The French Revolutionary Wars from 1789 through the 1790s and during the Napoleonic Wars from 1803 through 1815. Great Britain from the 1650s until 1914 had shown the world time and time again she was the rightful heir to world power. Her longtime contender, France, would devolve into multiple republics until the 1950s. Americans began to view World War I as just another one of those conflicts between European neighbors that have occurred so many times. Great Britain had become a great military and naval power to which they defended this position through warfare. And with colonies around the world, Great Britain protected her possessions, if necessary, using military force. Such features were tied to the continuation of peaceful world trade and the empire's national economy. In cultures around the world, how we do things and what we believe in makes us ethnically unique. Sometimes domestic qualities are challenged by our own neighbors as conflicts over ideological differences develop. Prior to World War I, four features stand out. These include aspects of militarism, imperialism, secret diplomacy, and an arms race. Militarism is a cultural attribute. Some nations, such as India, hold standards of passivity. Alternatively, European nations have long held beliefs in preservation of the state through military effort. This ancient philosophy was formed during the classical age of the Greeks and has become testament of the relationship between a state and the responsibility by its citizens to protect it when it becomes necessary. 
Thus governments from ancient times have formed militaries to combat foreign threats. What better event for a nation to prove its newfound authority and power but through armed conflict? In an imperial age, fitness of a nation was all the talk. Russia was humiliated by 1903 with the short war with Japan over access to timber in China. The Austrian-Serbia conflict, which should have been the Balkan War No. 3, was a way to rewrite how Russian military readiness was perceived by her neighbors. With the fall of the Roman Empire in the 5th century AD, nations of the post-Roman East and West all shared a common history of militarism. These national regions from the Iberian West to the former Byzantine Empire to the East, north to Russia to Scandinavia and Britain, reward military achievements by honoring families, if especially successful in thwarting off the enemy. Typically, government rewards came in the form of land, money, and or improved political and social status, to name a few. Thus, imperial ventures and military aims have a long history among Europeans. From the 1890s, and more so in the early 1900s, which is the height of imperialism, British and French politicians have explicitly expressed their views that with the unification of Germany by 1871, war was inevitable in Europe. Germany, now unified, posed as a real threat to the military supremacy of the British Empire. British observers saw Germany as the aggressor, as a bully. Was the Kaiser really going to try to recreate or resurrect the Holy Roman Empire, ended in 1806 by Napoleon? If so, this would mean war without a doubt. It would mean acquisition by Germany of Belgium, France, Poland, the Balkans, and Italy. Some of these, of course, these areas, including Austria-Hungary, were not so together unwilling. However, it meant mainly changes in European geography. British conservatives likened their king's German cousin, the Kaiser, to Napoleon and a serious threat to European independence, trade, and peace. Secondly, factors of imperialism and territorial and economic competition drove a wedge between international relations over time. Nations such as Britain, France, Spain, Portugal, and the Netherlands have for centuries operated as imperial colonial countries. After the Napoleonic Wars, new nations such as Belgium, wanted to get in on the game. A nation desiring to be recognized as a world-class power needed colonies. So the scramble for Africa began in the 1860s. Such as President Theodore Roosevelt would argue when encouraging a military coup during the construction of the Panama Canal, it was commonly argued that underdeveloped countries would be better off through an alliance made with developed nations. This relationship between countries would allow non-Christian peoples, especially, to enjoy enlightenment and modernity when exposed to the three C's. These are commerce, civilization, and Christianity. This European competition for colonial possessions 
was a relatively peaceful one. The only armed conflict that arose between European nations over colonial possessions was the Boer War between the Dutch settlers of the Transvaal in South Africa and the British government, once diamonds were found. So competition continued at a rapid rate for 30 years from the 1860s to the 1890s. By 1914, the British Empire flew its Union Jack over 25% of the land on Earth and held this power by its naval authority and respected militarism. A third feature that figures in has to do with secret diplomacy and alliances. This war involved secret talks behind closed doors, letters between families, and political envy by some. All three of the reigning monarchs were related. The three cousins included the following. Willie, otherwise known to history as Kaiser Wilhelm II of Germany. Nikki, respectively known as Tsar Nicholas of Russia. And our third cousin, Georgie, King George V, King of the United Kingdom of Great Britain. Both King George V and Kaiser Wilhelm II were grandsons of England's Queen Victoria. The Tsar Nicholas II was the third grandson of Queen Victoria through marriage. In essence, they were all cousins. In this royal kin network, not only were relatives heading nation states, but one invaded the other depending on the territorial dispute at the time. By 1864, after fighting both Prussia and Austria, the Danish government ceded territories to Prussia. Queen Victoria's daughter Vicky had married Friedrich III, the next in line for the Prussian monarchy. Both Vicky and Friedrich were humiliated by this aggressive move by the Prussian government under Wilhelm I. Queen Victoria's other daughter, Helena, had married Prince Christian of the Schweistik Holstein of the disputed Danish territories. One can only imagine what family reunions would be like. In Catherine Clay's King, Kaiser, and Tsar, that was published in 2007. The journalist, well, I would also call her a royal historian, with permission given from Queen Elizabeth II, received the privilege, for the sake of history, to evaluate the content of private letters between Queen Victoria and her family and her private journal from the royal family's private vault. The book itself is a fascinating evaluation, not only of history and the international political shifts at stake, but of family dynamics and intrigue. Clay illustrated the close connection between related royals as history unfolded, all the while Queen Victoria had become the grandmother of Europe. As the children and grandchildren of Queen Victoria and her German husband, Prince Albert, married other royals from Denmark, Spain, Prussia, Germany, Russia, France, Greece, and Belgium, it seemed likely political disputes and family scheming was only a matter of time. On the other hand, but creating such strategic marriages, it was the goal by Victoria and Albert to see peace come to Europe after centuries of war by forming close family ties. After the unification of Germany in 1871, European nations had quietly been creating alliances. Though not legally binding, in theory, smaller nations or those with close ties 
promise to come to the aid of the other. For example, Britain and France side the Entente Cordiale. Germany and Austria-Hungary form the Triple Alliance, while Britain, France, and Russia formed a pact known as the Triple Entente. The Treaty of London agreed to support Belgium's neutrality, and if invaded, Britain would send military assistance to protect her. A fourth feature was that of the arms race. Winston Churchill once said, this is a pushing age and we must push like the best of them. In 1890, Kaiser Wilhelm II fired his chancellor, Otto von Bismarck, the man who made Germany in the first place by 1871, due to his military intelligence and political ways under the former Kaiser, Willy's grandfather, Wilhelm I. Once engaged in an arms race with Britain, war seemed inevitable with Germany. However, by the early 1910s, Germany was losing the arms race. While the King, the Kaiser, and the Tsar could not declare war by their own wishes, being related to one another created family jealousies, otherwise thought of, I suppose, as family dynamics in a time of imperial conquest and colonialism. Why was this war recognized by future rivals as seen as inevitable? Many believed Germany would make a preemptive strike against her neighbors to redraw territorial boundaries, for example, uh, in efforts to help feed the German people better. In Europe from the 1890s, authors of popular fiction kept busy publishing various plots of impending war between France, Russia, Germany, and Britain. This reading culminates with the political discussion of the crisis of July 1914 following the June 28th assassination of the Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria and his wife Sophie, and the declaration by Britain to declare war on Germany. An overview of popular fiction that sold millions of books on this very theme stands to support the position that while in America the war was viewed as inevitable, it was not perceived that way in Europe at all. Popular fictional war themes portrayed European nations in armed conflict. This made for popular reading by British, French, and German residents. Sooner or later, it seemed war would come between the great powers of Europe. While this rising conflict was often ignored or criticized in the United States, fictional sources from the 1890s abounded. By 1902, A.C. Curtis, author of A New Trafalgar, wrote the first novel to imagine a German naval strike against Britain. After the Boer War, French and German collaboration books appeared such as La Guerre avec l'Angleterre. This is the war with the British. Published date of 1900. With the development of concentration camps, their respect internationally had eroded as they had not shown dignity for human life. In 1904, published in Germany, would be World War German Dreams by August Niemann. Imagine the armies and fleets of German, France, and Russia moving together against the common enemy Britain, whose arms enfold the globe. Britain by this point did not have such a grasp. While Niemann invokes confidence of a German victory, other German writers such as Sink, Burn, Destroy, The Blow Against Germany, in which a British Navy defeats German forces. 
During and after the war, two significant examples include the best English seller in 1916, Mr. Britling Sees Through It by H.G. Wells, and from the German point of view, a book to film classic remains Enrique Maria Remarque's 1929 Still Impressive, All Quiet on the Western Front, which became a film in 1930. All the while, magazines published continuing fictional stories as articles. A popular theme among readers was an invasion plot. In 1900, published in Germany was The Reckoning with England by Karl Anshartz, in which Britain in this storyline was defeated in the Boer War and was attacked by France to which Germany joins that conflict. In 1906, London's Daily Mail published a series of articles which became a best-selling novel, The Invasion of 1910. Later in the year, in 1914, it became a popular silent film. Why did the Germans gamble on war in 1914? Historically speaking, when a nation state has in the past enjoyed glory, power, and authority, it is logical to assume some would want to see times of glory return. By the 1910s, Europe is divided into two opposing alliances. Europe is politically two imperial factions. Each seem to be on a collision course. The Allied countries, including most of the Western world and the Commonwealth countries. These democratically elected national governments stood in direct opposition to the older style governments with autocratic rulership and weak parliament styled elected governments such as in Germany and Russia. German war aims theory that was argued by diplomats supported the notion that once Germany united it would seek to retake former regions of the Holy Roman Empire transforming it into Kaiser's European Union. Dismantled in 1808 during the Napoleonic Wars, the Holy Roman Empire had consisted of vast areas in Europe. From Germany, principalities to Italy, Austria, Switzerland, and parts of Northern Europe. All the while, the Ottoman Empire in the Balkans was losing its grasp on its territories. European powers watched and waited for the right opportunity to acquire new colonial regions. Desires by Germany to acquire strategic colonies were long desired. For decades, the Russians and the Austrians, along with the rest of Europe, eyed the shrinking fate of the Muslim Ottoman Empire. Slowly, northern and eastern territories, formerly under their control, became weak, independently run nations, such as Bosnia and Serbia, places that would become very important. While Austria and Russia had competed for former Ottoman territories, Austria by 1910 had an administrative hold on Bosnia. Some anti-government groups did not like this. However, Bosnia had its own parliament and political system. Terrorist groups, however, developed in time. For Germany, it was a questionable time in regards whether or not to engage in war in 1914. But then a situation would present itself by the summer. But first, it's important to assess Germany's achievements by 1914 with the ongoing arms race. First of all, I'd like you to consider the ratio of British to German warship tonnage. This is over a period of decades. All right, first of all, the decade of 1880. 
British tonnage was 7 to 4 of that of Germany. So it was about double. By 1880, the British had lost their edge because their tonnage was 3 to a German capacity of 6. By 1900, this was about the same. And by 1910, however, the British had recovered and it was about even, 2 to 3 tonnage at this point. However, by 1914, the British ratio of tonnage had pulled ahead to double that of the German capacity. Another way you could measure this is in regards to naval strength of the powers of 1914. I have a table here in front of me and without reading all of this for you, just generally I want to give you a bit of an overview. Uh, for Russia, they had naval vessels of four. France had naval vessels comprised of 10 and Britain had 29 at this point. So between Russia, France and Britain, there was a total of 43 large naval vessels with personnel totaling 331,000. Now let's take a look at Germany, Austria, Hungary. For Germany, they had 17 large naval vessels by 1914. Austria, Hungary, with only 16,000 in personnel, would have three large naval vessels. So this would bring the total to 20. And this is one of the reasons why I mentioned in 1914, the Allies, um, considered here um, as headed by the British, uh, their capacity was two to one over the Germans. As early as 1908, German officials believed they had lost the arms race. Their hopes of glory floundered. However, German politicians believed if they could keep England absent from the war or as a limited enemy, they had a good chance of coming out victorious with more land acquired along the way. In theory, France, the Balkans, and Poland would fall to Germany. Once the heir to the Austrian-Hungarian throne, the Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his wife Sophie were assassinated on June 28, 1914. Germany policymakers saw this event in Sarajevo as their window of opportunity to enter this Austrian-Serbian conflict and give a preemptive strike of war to France and other German neighbors to whom they considered a threat. Austria controlled Bosnia. This is the neighbor of Serbia to the west by 1910. This was a multi-ethnic nation with a history of violence. Formerly a member of the Ottoman Empire, a terrorist student group developed resulting in an assassination of the Austrian royal and his wife. The government of Austria blamed Serbia. Actually, this was not a plot by the Serbian government. Germany, an ally of Austria, promised to come to the help of Austria if it came to war. Germany expected to squash the conflict in a localized area claim victory and take possession of the Serbian-Bosnian area of the Balkans. From the early 1900s, Germany had long desired control of the Dardanelles Straits, the waterway to pass through to get to the Black Sea, bypassing the Ottoman stronghold of former Constantinople, take control of the peninsula of Anatolia, and put under German control Asian trade routes. The political machine cranked into motion with this terrorist attack on Austrian royalty. This translated into a slight on Austria which impacted Germany's image. By killing the Archduke 
personalities swung into motion. Almost like a chess game in which one player topples another player's key piece in the game. Retribution resulted. The July crisis is remembered in history as the post-assassination political turmoil. Rumors circulated. Russia announced they were going to mobilize their army against Austria to come in to support Serbia. German leaders and Kaiser Wilhelm believed a preemptive strike would be the best plan of attack. The Russo-Japanese War just a few years earlier had shown the Russian army to be behind the times and not equipped to move fast or effectively to Serbia. However, the variable in all of this was a question. Would France and Britain come into this conflict if Austrian-German forces were fighting it out with Russia in their goals to protect Serbia from Germany. This was the gamble Germany was betting on because France, history has shown, could easily lose if Germany invaded. France and Britain were not legally obligated to fight Germany if Russia did. Meanwhile, Germany encouraged Austria to invade, knowing that this was the spark of war necessary to begin to set this path into motion. By July 29th, Britain's official position was that if France was invaded by Germany, the British would defend France. By July 30th, Russian troops were on the move on their way to Serbia. There was an announcement on July 27th to this effect and it was found later to be false. At this point, German advisors were heaping up the propaganda as though the time was at this moment imminent danger ahead. U.S. involvement includes the following. Woodrow Wilson's diplomat, Colonel House, sends word from Europe to the president stating, quote, what Germany really wants is for England to detach itself from the Triple Alliance, end of quote. By July 30th and August 1st, France wavered on the idea of their support of Russia. At this point, German officials are watching France and England's every move. The breakup of the Triple Alliance might happen after all, putting them in a seriously advantageous position. European officials perceived German involvement as aggressive. For reasons of national security and world trade, war seemed necessary to rid the world of bullies from time to time. On July 30th, the Kaiser announced that England, Russia, and France have agreed to use the Austrian-Serbian conflict as an excuse for waging war to exterminate us." End of quote. Across July, meetings and telephone calls were constant at State Departments. After receiving the news, President Wilson understood diplomacy had broken down and it seemed to American observers Europe was on a headlong path to war. Why did British leaders decide to enter the war in 1914? England could have had a limited involvement in the Great War. The British government, under the Articles of the Triple Entente, was not legally obligated to fight in defense of France or Russia. The argument for the British to go to war rested on the belief of Germany's true war aims. They believed they consisted of the following four factors. Number one, Germany had political, economic, and cultural reasons to get involved with Russia over Serbia. 
Number two, Germany wanted to acquire African territories held by Britain for reasons of trade and resources. Number three, Germany wanted to recreate or reinvent a new Holy Roman Empire under the Kaiser's control. And number four, Germany wanted to break up the British and Russian empires by encouraging internal conflict. On August 2nd, the British Parliament debated to go to war for the right reasons or to stay out of it. It was argued this conflict would not end in the Balkans, but in time it would mean the fall of the Netherlands, Belgium, and then England. On August 3rd, Germany declared war on France with plans the following day to invade Belgium on its way to France. By August 4th, it was Prime Minister Asquith who declared war on Germany in a response to the German invasion of Belgium. As of 1839, Britain had agreed to protect Belgium's neutrality. On this day, the British cabinet voted to declare war against Germany. On August 5th, after Britain declared to go to war with Germany, the British people were given three reasons why their government had taken this action to support their allies on the continent. Number one, the German fleet should not occupy, under our neutrality, the North Sea and the English Channel. Number two, that Germany should not seize and occupy the northwest part of France opposite our shores. And number three, that Germany should not violate the ultimate independence of Belgium and hereafter occupy Antwerp as a standing menace to us. While the American government watched and waited, they remained politically neutral until 1917. For three long years, American businesses and banking institutions would support the efforts of her Western European allies until the war would threaten America's national security, until the British interception of the Zimmerman telegram implying Mexico would side with the Kaiser, Americans watched the war from a distance and advocated to remain neutral.